Sauron is a shapeshifter taking on different physical forms at different times. So what makes him the same character from one of these forms to the next? In this video, I'm going to explain why philosophers worry about this kind of problem, the problem of personal identity, and what some of their solutions are. And I'm going to explain why Sauron plus another character from Middle-earth together mess up these philosophical theories. So make sure you keep watching to the end of the video for that and we're going to get going right now. Sauron was a mayor, a spirit called Myron, but seeking power, he joined forces with Melkor, who would later be known as Morgoth, and then Myron became known as Gorthar. He survived Morgoth's capture at the end of the First Age. In the Second Age, he deceives the elves into forging the Rings of Power, and secretly he forges his own ring in Mount Doom. And then he becomes the Dark Lord, the Lord of the Rings. And he adopted many physical forms. In the tale of Beren and Luthien, in the First Age, he fights Huan, the Hound of Valinor, in the form of a werewolf. He becomes trapped in Huan's jaws and he changes into a great serpent, but unable to get free, he transforms into his true appearance. And then he's released and he flees in the form of a vampire. Later in the Second Age, he puts on the fair form of Anatar, the Lord of Gifts. And that's when he deceives the elves into forging the Rings of Power. This story is told slightly differently in the Rings of Power TV series, where we discover that Sauron has taken the form of a human, a man. So Sauron can and does take on many different physical forms. So our philosophical question here is, why are all of these different physical forms Sauron? What makes them all different forms of one and the same character? So this brings us to the philosophical problem of personal identity, specifically the problem of identity over time. What makes a person the same person they were five days ago, 10 years ago, over their entire life? This is sometimes called the problem of diachronic identity, diachronic over time. So I compose this problem in my own case, for instance. What makes me, the person now talking to you about philosophy, the same as this squidgy pink thing here, or this posing idiot here? What makes all of these part of the same person? Well, philosophers over time have come up with basically two main kinds of theory. The first theory, perhaps the most obvious one, focuses on a person's physical being, their body. It says that people are biological organisms, they are physical things, they are essentially animals. So identity over time consists in having the same body, or at least continuity, causal continuity from one moment to the next. Of course, our bodies change physically over time. I was once this tiny squidgy pink thing and then this posing idiot and now this is the body I have. But from one moment to the next, there was a causal process whereby that body changed into that body and then changed into this physical lump that you've got here. So this causal process, as long as it has continuity from each moment to the next, allows us to say that this and this and this are all the same person. This view is sometimes called the brute physical view because there are brute physical facts about our identity over time. It's sometimes called animalism because it's basically saying a person's identity over time is more or less the same as saying that's the same animal. The second philosophical theory of personal identity I want to tell you about is the psychological continuity view. So on this view, it's not your physical being, but it's your psychological being, your mental life that determines whether we've got the same person over time. In order for this person to be the same as that person, according to this view, we need psychological continuity. So for instance, we find this kind of view in philosophers like John Locke, who focus quite heavily on memory, the continuance of memory, in order to say this is the same person as this. And the idea, very roughly, is that I'm identical to this posing idiot here because I have memories of being that person. I remember it from the inside. So I don't just remember it 
as an event like I remember, say, going to my friend's 20th birthday party. I remember being that person and experiencing their experiences from the inside. Now, if all we focus on is memory, we're likely to come a cropper here because of the transitivity problem. Middle-aged person might remember being the teenager and the old man might remember being the middle-aged person, but the old man might not remember being the teenager. Okay, those memories might have gone by then. But we can't have it that the teenager is identical to the middle-aged and the middle-aged is identical to the old person without the old person being identical to the teenager. Identity is transitive. And there are other issues with a view that focuses just on memory, like I don't remember being this pink squishy thing because when I was that pink squishy thing, I wasn't forming long-term memories that are going to stay with me till middle age. So a better way of thinking about a psychological continuity view is we don't just focus on memory. We don't just say, oh, if you lose a memory, suddenly you're a different person. We talk about psychological continuity. From each moment to the next, there is enough psychological continuity, including memory, including sense of self and all that kind of stuff. So long as that is preserved from one moment to the next, we're talking about the same person. And you might think that that approach is the right kind of way of explaining the Sauron problem. How can Sauron be identical over time, even though he's shifting his physical form around? Well, because his mental life is preserved through all of those changes. He changes on the outside physically, but on the inside, it's the same person. It's got the same mental states, the same beliefs and desires and evil intents to kind of take over all of Middle Earth and all that kind of stuff. So let me now tell you about Neonor. Neonor was a daughter of Hurin, but before she's born, Hurin goes to fight off in the near Nyth, the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, and he's captured by Morgoth's forces. Morgoth keeps him alive and places a curse on him and on his children. After the battle, her mother, Morwen, sends her son, Turin, to the elves in Doriath for his safety. Much later, Morwen and Neonor also travel to Doriath, looking for Turin, but by this time, he is long gone. But while they're staying in Doriath, news comes from the elven city of Nargothron of a powerful warrior, a man who they suspect might be Turin. However, by this point, Nargothron has been overrun by Morgoth's forces, led by the dragon Glaurung. More where Neonor and elf guides head out to Nargothron. But as they approach, Glaurung knows about it and he sets out to meet them. Trying to stay out of harm's way, Neonor climbs a hill overlooking the city. And as she comes over the top, she looks directly into Glaurung's eyes. He casts a spell on her, forcing her to reveal that she is a daughter of Hurin. And then he places her in a trance and she forgets, she forgets everything. Who she is, where she was born, where she's come from. She even forgets all her words and becomes unable to speak. The elf guides start to lead her back to Doriath, but they're attacked by orcs. And in a panic, Neonor flees so fast through the trees and later she's found by a bunch of outlaws completely naked and crying. Their leader is a man called Turambar, master of fates. Hmm, we'll see about that. She's unable to say her name, so he calls her Niniel, Tear Maiden. And they fall in love, they marry, and they're going to have a baby. But before the baby's born, Turambar decides he has to go off and fight the dragon, Glaura. And he's successful. He manages to track the dragon and mortally wound it. But he himself is injured, and he goes into a faint. To all the world, he looks as if he's dead. Niniel, having followed Turambar, comes across this scene and thinking him dead. And then, with his dying words, Glaurung the dragon reveals to Niniel that she is Neonor, a daughter of Hurin, and her husband, Turambar, is in fact Turin, son of Hurin, her own brother. And as the dragon dies, his enchantment lifts and she recognizes this to be true. She remembers, she is grief struck and she is panicked. She runs and she throws herself from the gorge of Cabadinaris and ends her life. Is Niniel the same person as Neonor? Well, on the one hand, Niniel can remember nothing. She knows nothing of Neonor. She can't remember being Neonor. There is no psychological continuity between Niniel and Neonor. It's not just that she can't remember. Her entire sense of self 
disappears under the dragon's spell. But after all, we want to say that they are the same person, the same character. That is the whole point of the story. If Neonel isn't the same person as Neonor, then she wouldn't be Turin's brother and there would be no problem. The psychological continuity view works great for Sauron and explains why all of these different physical forms of Sauron are the same person, they're the same character, but it doesn't work for Neonor. It doesn't explain why Neonor is the same person as Niniel. It's the physical view, the brute physical view of personal identity that works best for Neonor, right? Neonor and Niniel are the same person because they are the same animal, the same human animal, same body, just different mental states, different mental personality. So we have these two characters, we have two different views. One works for one character, one works for the other, but none of those views work for both characters. Now, okay, you might go, look, Mark, these characters aren't real. They're fictional characters. So why do we have to worry about them? And usually in the case of fiction, identity is simple because we have a narrator and the narrator tells us that this is Sauron and this is Sauron, even though they look really different. But the problem wasn't just working out which character was which in a fiction. The problem is that these characters are counterexamples to the philosophical view. If our concept of personal identity was just like the psychological continuity view says it is, then we wouldn't be able to make sense of a story in which we've got Neonor and Niniel and no psychological continuity between them. We wouldn't be able to make sense of that, but we can do easily. So that can't be how our concept goes. And similarly, if our concept of personal identity was as the physical, the brute physicalist account has it, then we wouldn't be able to make sense of a character like Sauron shape-shifting, changing his physical form. But we do, we have no problem with that. So our concept of personal identity can't be like that. So which philosophical theory best explains our concept of personal identity? I think that's an open question. If you want to learn more about philosophical arguments like this one, click on this playlist over here. Thank you so much to all my Ko-Fi supporters who make this content possible. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you guys back here soon.